Okay, my friends, well, we're uh, going to uh, open up a study in the New Testament letter to the Colossians, to the church in Colossae. And so if you have your Bibles with you, uh, and you'll want to make sure you bring it every week, we're going to be in the book of Colossians. Colossians. I want to begin with a question this morning as we get ready to get into our study. And this is not an kind of a, a not an elementary question for some Christians around the world who uh, live in areas where Christianity is persecuted, maybe even forbidden, uh, places uh, where the underground church tend to flourish. Uh, over time, uh, Christians there, uh, they can get in big trouble, even pay with their lives if they are worshiping or give evidence that Christianity is a part of their lives. There was a famous story from uh, Poland back during the Warsaw Pact days when the Soviets kind of ruled over Eastern Europe and two soldiers burst into a, a secret church meeting one Sunday and uh, they had you know, brandishing weapons and things like that and with kind of vile cursing and things like that said, if you are here and worshiping Christ this morning, soon you will die. But if you're not here and you don't believe in Christ, then you need to go ahead and leave. And about half of the little gathering that morning, immediately they flee out of the, the, the church gathering there. So they're, they're not interested in paying with their life and dealing with these two guys and their machine guns and such. And so they all run out the door and the, the, the soldiers allow them to leave. And as soon as they all flee, the two soldiers close the doors and they lower their weapons and they said, we are Christians too. And we wanted to know that we were amongst true believers. So kind of a, a fascinating thing. Of course, we all know that when the wall came down in 89 and Eastern Europe, they experienced glasnost and the end of the Soviet Union and things like that before Putin, uh, the church really opened up. And one of the ministries we support, Eastern European missions, continues to bring Bibles into that part of the world because there's such a deep hunger for it after 70 years of communism. So an amazing thing. Here's a question for you this morning. If you or I were arrested and we were to be put on trial for being a Christian, you know, those kangaroo courts in these places, North Korea and other things, this does happen. But if we were put on trial for being a Christian, what would be right now in your life or my life the greatest evidence that we are guilty as charged? We're here. We're gathered here this morning. That would make us guilty. We have Bibles. We have copies of God's Word. This is one of the most banned books around the world. Illegal to possess a copy of more than any other. We're always talking about banned books during Banned Book Library Week. I sometimes get a kick out of that. It doesn't take too much to be called a banned book today. Usually what they talk about when they talk about banned books is some concerned parent somewhere has found sexually explicit materials that were filed away in the toddler or elementary thing and said that should not be here. And then all of a sudden, you know, everybody's up in arm because Christians are trying to ban books. That's not the same thing. <laughs> it had the opposite effect, yeah. They become bestsellers. Does anybody know what the perennial best-selling book in the world is? It is the Bible. Yeah, it is the Bible. And this might surprise some, but still, the most sold Bible is the King James translation amongst all the other translations uh, and things like that. So sometimes people are surprised by that, but that, that has been the case since they... Uh, first started uh, tracking publishing records. The Bible is the best selling. Well, we are in the Bible this morning, and the invitation is to think about our life in Christ. And if you were to ask me what the theme of the book of Colossians is, I would tell you it's the preeminence of Christ, that there is no one greater than Jesus Christ. And Paul is going to really make that clear during the course of our study. So if you have a Colossians open there, I want to ask somebody to read the first eight verses. And then what I really want to do today, before we get digging in over the next 12 weeks to our study 
it's a short letter and we can take time a little bit. I want to tell you a little bit about the circumstances that led to this church. And then I want to talk a little bit together about the major themes of the letter to the Colossians. So we need to do some introduction. But Tim, do you have uh, Colossians open there? Would you mind reading Colossians chapter 1, verses 1 through 8? We always thank God, Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, and pray for you. We heard of your faith in Christ Jesus and of the love that you have for all the saints, because of the hope laid up for you in heaven. Of this we have heard before in the word of the truth, the gospel, which has come to you, as indeed in the whole world it is bearing fruit and increasing, as it is also doing it does since the day you heard it and understood the grace of God and truth, just as you learned it from Epaphras, our beloved fellow servant, he is a faithful minister of Christ on your behalf and has made known to us your love and spirit. Did you say eight? Yeah, stop right there. That's uh, that's perfect. So the title of the book is Colossians, and it's named after the city where this, uh, uh, this particular church met, uh, the city of Colossae, and the church that was there, uh, they're the ones to which this letter was addressed. And uh, it actually was read in more places than just Colossae. Over in uh, this letter, Colossians 4.16, we're told that uh, a neighboring church in a town called Laodicea, Laodicea might sound familiar to you if you know about the seven churches in the book of Revelation, they would have received this letter as well. So that's where the title Colossians comes from. It was uh, a city where a church met, a church of Christ, the Colossian Church of Christ uh, met, and they received these, uh, these materials from, well, somebody very special. Who wrote this letter? Paul. What do we know about the Apostle Paul? Yeah, he started out life not in ministry, right, to the church of Jesus Christ. Paul was a, you use the word persecutor. What, what do we know about what Paul did to the early church? <laughs> Sharon laughs because he did a lot to the early church, yeah. He was somebody who really persecuted it. He uh, was there very famously at the stoning of the first Christian martyr. Does anybody know who that is? Stephen. Yeah, Stephen had been a deacon in the church and uh, was killed uh, in a very common way at that time by having rocks thrown at him, a terrible way to die. Uh, before he died, though, he looked up and he saw Jesus standing at the right hand of God the Father, and he yielded up his spirit to, to the Lord. And uh, Paul was there, and Paul uh, began a, a campaign of persecution centered in Jerusalem but spreading out and tried to, uh, tried to kill Christians. Uh, in the early church. Now, what do we know about Paul's later life? What happens to Paul while he's doing all this persecuting? When he wrote this letter, he's in prison, yeah, under house arrest in uh, Rome. Very good. Now, Paul, he had a bit of a change of heart as a young man. He was on, a way, on the way to a place called Damascus. Uh, and what happened on the way there to Damascus? He was blinded by, by Christ. And Jesus asks him the most important question he was ever asked. Saul, Saul, why are you persecuting me? And he was blinded. And in one of the most dramatic conversions in the New Testament uh, becomes really the greatest champion of the early church in terms of evangelism, in terms of the suffering that he experienced. And uh, Paul sometimes is known as the 13th apostle. An apostle untimely born, meaning he never met during Jesus' earthly life, the Lord Jesus Christ, but he encountered him later on once he had already ascended to the throne in a kind of visionary way. And Jesus himself appears to uh, Saul, later Paul, 
and he is converted. So Paul's identified right away as the author at the beginning um, of the letter. It says, Paul, an apostle of Jesus Christ, by the will of God, and someone else is listed, Timothy, our brother. Very good. So this is a, a customary opening. And um, that's not disputed at all. The, the, the authorship, the early church, key figures like Irenaeus, uh, men like uh, Clement of Alexandria, Tertullian, and Origen, the earliest great church historian named Eusebius. You may have heard his uh, name before. They all name Paul as, uh, as the author. Uh, there's a lot of internal evidence that Paul wrote this. I think the most important is that it says that right there in verse 1. But there are some parallel themes, and oftentimes you'll find Colossians and Philemon closely allied to each other. In fact, there's people named in each of those letters uh, that are named and uh, that are uh, uh, coincident with Paul. Now, Dorothea already noted rightly that Paul, when he wrote this, was a, uh, a prisoner under house arrest in Rome. So the dating of that, we know that time that he was there, is somewhere uh, AD 60 to 62. He spent a couple of years under house arrest in Rome, so that's the time in which this was written. He was a prisoner in Rome. We know that from this letter. He talks about it. He talks about it in Philemon. And he names many of the same people in the letter to Philemon in this one. He mentions Timothy, um, Aristarchus, Archippus is another name that comes up, Mark, and then a very important early disciple named Epaphras. Epaphras or Epaphras sometimes. I think that's probably a better pronunciation, sorry. Luke gets named here. Also Demas, and then Onesimus, who was the runaway slave that became a Christian. That's the subject of the book of Philemon. So, same authorship, uh, and you know a lot about Paul already. Now, I've already said that the city where this church met is Colossae. Does anybody have any idea where that was? In Asia? Yeah. In particular, Western Asia. Sometimes people will call it Western Asia Minor. The easiest way to think about its location today is to think of the modern country of Turkey. So we know where Turkey is. It's um, in Western Asia Minor, kind of in the peninsula, not far from where uh, the Greek... Uh, country is. And so uh, in the day that uh, Paul was writing, it was not known as Turkey. It was a Roman province, and they called it in those times Phrygia. Phrygia. But that's where um, Colossae uh, is. It's about 100 miles east of the city of Ephesus. And Ephesus is a name that's really, really familiar to us. And so Ephesus uh, is in the region of the seven churches of Revelation. And uh, Colossae was a beautiful town. Now, by the time that the church is uh, growing here, it was a little past its prime. There had been a main trade route that went through the area in Phrygia and the city of Colossae. But now, kind of, it was a little bit past that because the trade route has been rerouted, and now it goes through the place known as Laodicea. And so it's in a beautiful part of uh, modern Turkey called the Lycus River Valley. There's a beautiful river there. And uh, in that valley is where these Christians lived. And uh, there was a, a local mountain still, uh, Mount Cadmus, that, raise, uh, that raises, it's about 8,000 feet elevation, so it would have been a beautiful place to live. Uh, right now, my dad, Steve, is uh, he's uh, a business owner uh, and has had a what he said is his hardest year in, in work. He does home restoration work in Oklahoma, and this has been a particularly hot year. And some of the young employees for him, they've quit because it's been too hot to do the kind of work that they have. He's, he's been very frustrated by that. And so um, he's had to do a lot of the work himself. Uh, and uh, at 72 years old, he is strong as an ox. But he said, man, it's been hot. And he said, I don't know what's with these young guys. They can't keep up with me. But uh, about a week ago, he said, you know, it has been really hot, Matthew. I'm going to Colorado, <laughs> and I'm going to get up in the mountains where it's like the weather where you are. I said, well, why don't you just come to Michigan? He goes, well, Colorado's pretty beautiful, and it's got the Rockies. And I 
He's going to be there for 30 days, cooling off. I think if you lived in the Lycus River Valley, it would be beautiful like it is in the Rockies. Has anybody ever been to the Southern Rockies or maybe gone to some of those places? Just beautiful. Myosha, being from Texas, will appreciate sometimes Texans have to retreat up into the upper elevations of the Southern Rockies just to get away from the heat during the summer. A lot of people will go in northern New Mexico up to the southern Rocky chain comes down through there, and, and you're at a higher elevation, so it's cooler, and it's just beautiful. The Lycus River Valley would have been like that. So a little bit about the church in Colossae. The church was comprised of both Jewish and Gentile believers. Now, does anybody want to take a stab at what a Gentile is? It's not a Jew. Anyone that's not a Jew. Tim nailed it on the head. That's right. Somebody that's not of Jewish ancestry. And so Jewish and Gentile people comprise this. Uh, and so uh, the Jews had been there since the time of the test between the testaments, the intertestamental period. And so this shows up in the composition of the church. Now, at this point, it's totally fair if you're thinking, I don't need these details, they're a little boring. I don't know that I need to know that the church was comprised of Jews and Gentiles. Let me make the case that this is actually important, particularly as we study this letter. One of the themes of this letter is that there is a false teaching in this church. And the true nature of it shows up, and we'll talk about it here in just a minute, but it almost certainly is a false teaching that is linked to the fact that there are both Jews and Gentiles in this church, and some Jewish teachings and some Greek teachings have come together and they've made a love child that's not Christian. That's kind of a tacky way to say it, but I'm just getting to the point here. Has anybody ever heard of the word syncretism? That's probably not a, I mean, that's a Jeopardy word. Or if you, what, if you did that on Scrabble, I don't know. What would syncretism be on Scrabble? It'd probably be a thousand points or something. But syncretism is a word that just describes when Two teachings that really are distinct come together and become kind of a third other thing. And that was very common in the first century, and it's a real problem in Colossae because this blending of pagan ideas and Christian teachings brought together in a false teaching was really influencing the way that these believers saw Christ, who Christ is. It was a, a false teaching that ultimately affected their view of Jesus, which is why in this letter, he teaches a lot about Jesus. Raymond. Yeah. Yeah. Um, it's the background, as you say, that was the real issue. Let me give you a little bit of a, it's a PG-13 related illustration here uh, from my own early ministry to kind of give you an idea about how somebody's background really does impact the way that they think about the world. So I did ministry early on to uh, a group of uh, believers, all of whom were a part of a mental health system uh, and a hospital that was located near a church building in Oklahoma where I worked. And we had a small group, and all of them knew each other from the behavioral health uh, outpatient clinic that they got care from, and they would go to the same clinic to get medicines and things like that. And many of them started coming to church, and at first the church was not really sure because they often have special needs and special things that they needed kind of what to do. And so um, I was a young minister on a staff in a larger church, and they said, Matthew, would you be willing to minister to these men and women who are coming, form kind of a, a small group or a fellowship group community? And we ended up having 50 people just in that small group um, and, and stuff. And I learned a lot about mental health and uh, the lack of resources for mental health and other things like that from that experience. But we had two uh, young people who were married. Uh, they had met each other in the clinic there, and they began studying, and they began um, uh, wanting, they wanted to get baptized. So we studied with them, and they eventually uh, were baptized, which was wonderful. 
And um, I got a call about two days after. This was like, um, I guess on a Sunday they got baptized in the church, and then I think it was Tuesday or something I got a call. And um, the young man on the other end, the husband, he was very tearful, and he said, I've, I've done a terrible thing. I, I just didn't realize it until somebody else that I know pointed it out, but I need you to come over and we need to talk to you. And of course, I don't, I don't know what that thing is yet, so I went over to the house and just cut to the chase through the tears. He said, so we got baptized on Sunday, and this is one of the greatest things that's ever happened to us. And I said, great. So, you know, what's going on now? It seems like I'm not sensing joy. I'm sensing a lot of sadness. And he goes, I've really messed up. I said, well, what happened? And he goes, well, you know, we, we've never been in the church. We, we still don't have a lot of sense of what you do and you don't do. And he said, we celebrated our baptism later that night. We drank a lot of beer and we ended up doing something sexually inappropriate, me and my wife, with a third person. Okay, I got to tell you at that point, I felt the earth shake under me. I, I can say I've never had anybody celebrate a baptism like that. And at first I think, what have I done? Like I've, I've misapplied baptism. I've done something, you know, I haven't taught appropriately and all this thing. And it, I had to stop for a minute and remember, these are folks that have never, first off, they come from horribly abusive homes and backgrounds. They've never been in the church. And nobody ever told them it was inappropriate to open up your marriage sexually to somebody else and be a polyamorous couple. I didn't use that word with them, but that's a word now. And they celebrated like they had always celebrated. And so, of course, I'm going through a bunch of soul searching and self-examination because I'm thinking, you know, is this wildly inappropriate, this ministry? I mean, I have all these self-doubts. And thankfully, one of the elders was so kind and gracious. He he sat me down and he said, I can tell you're really anxious right now. And I said, I'm extremely anxious. And he said, Matthew, you've got to remember, these folks are coming from a vastly different background than you have ever experienced. You, you never would have anticipated something like this. And so we do need to meet with them. They need to be repentant. We also need to instruct them and help them understand some of their own habits and thought patterns and Things that they've done in the past are no longer appropriate because of their new identity in Christ. He did. And I think there was another, uh, another uh, person in the mental health group, that larger group that we were ministering in, that did that, who said, you did what? <laughs> and so there was some community regulation. When I think about that, though, it, it felt like the Wild West. I mean, I was really out of my element. And I don't tell that story to be scandalous in any ways, but just to say that I imagine sometimes the early church was a little like this in the sense that you had people, like Raymond was pointing out, from wildly different backgrounds. And if you think about where Colossae is, and this is why maybe these little details matter, this was Western Asia Minor. It's the place where East meets West, and a lot of the stuff coming out of the, the East uh, would be... Very strange, very fantastical, Zoroastrianism and some of these other kind of Eastern influences out of India and other places like that. And when that came kind of crashing together with Christianity, it often made a really strange matzo ball. <laughs> you know, it was bringing things together. And so for Paul, as a leader in this area who's writing from Rome, ministering in Ephesus uh, afterward, and before, um, he was really trying to help these people reconcile their backgrounds and bring them into the faith once for all delivered to the saints. Not an easy work at all. I would say some of my hardest years of ministry, during COVID was hard, but those first three or four years of ministry with the mental health folks, that was some of the hardest ministry I've ever done. And I really think God used that to help grow me so that I would be resilient later on. And so background really matters. It really, really matters. Does that make sense as an illustration? It's not a perfect illustration, but I think it gives you a sense that where people come from really affects how they view things. If you grew up, for example, in a parochial school, a Catholic school, or you grew up Catholic, that's going to affect the way that you uh, view certain things that we do. 
Maybe you grew up Lutheran or Presbyterian or something else. The Church of Christ uh, looks different in some ways than what you got used to. I had a good friend who was, um, she was Catholic and we worked together uh, at the university. And um, after I became a Christian, I was still at the university. I hadn't left for seminary yet. And I asked her, I said, you know, what's the, what's the habit? Do you read the Bible every day? And she laughed and she said, the priest is the one who reads the Bible. She said, that's, that's what you Protestants do. They're always about the Bible, the Bible, the Bible. She was like, why do I need to read the Bible? The priest would tell me what the Bible says. And I remember thinking, wow, you know, we just, it was a different view, a different view. So a lot of different views here, a lot of different views within this community. Okay. Well, um, let's read just a little bit in, uh, in Acts. I want to talk about the mission that brings this community to faith. And um, I want to surprise you maybe with something that you, uh, I don't, some of you may know or may not know. Um, well, here, let me, let me ask you. Did Paul ever minister in Colossae? Yeah, through his epistles. Through his epistles, yeah. Did he ever physically go to this place? I, the way I've asked it, you already know the answer, right? He never went, yeah. He never goes to this place. He ministers from afar. They got an email, didn't they? A big email. So let's turn over to the book of Acts. <laughs> if only it was that fast, yeah. Epaphras wouldn't have had to make such a long journey. <laughs> okay. All right. I just want to hit some highlights uh, here real quick. Um, Paul ministers uh, in Ephesus at... Um, uh, in Acts chapter 19. And um, he goes through this area. It's in Asia Minor. Ephesus is, remember, 100 miles away from where Colossae is. And Paul goes through this area back in Acts 19, and um, he encounters some disciples that become some of the first disciples in Western Asia Minor. So this is the, the birth of the church in this place. And there in Acts 19, I'm just going to begin reading in verse 1 and just give you a little bit of a history of how this church comes to be here. It says, It happened that while Apollos was at Corinth, so Apollos was another minister, he's ministering it in Greece at Corinth, Paul is passing through, it says, the upper country, and he came to Ephesus and found some disciples. Now, when we hear the word disciples, immediately we think Christian disciples, but that's not how Luke is using the phrase here. We're getting ready to find out that these were learners, they were followers, but they're not yet followers or learners like in Christ. They've been following something else. And so verse 2, it says, Paul said to them, did you receive the Holy Spirit when you believed? Now, Paul knows that all believers in Christ have the Holy Spirit. And so he asked them that. He's trying to discern a little bit more about their uh, their, their beliefs, their postures. And they say to him, it says, no, we have not even heard whether there is a Holy Spirit. And he said, well, into what then were you baptized? So he's doing his, his best uh, Columbo here. Okay. What were you baptized? And they said, into John's baptism. Ah, so who are these disciples of? John the Baptist. Very good. So Paul says, verse 4, John baptized with the baptism of repentance, telling the people to believe in him who was coming after him. That is in Jesus. So he says, you've learned some things, but you haven't learned fully. And what John the Baptist was doing was preparing the way for our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. And so he further instructs them. And then it says in verse 5, when they heard this, they were baptized in the name of the Lord Jesus. And when Paul had laid his hands upon them, the Holy Spirit came on them, and they began speaking with tongues and prophesying. There were in all about 12 men. So these are some of the first disciples in Western Asia Minor. This ministry, it's spreading. Jesus said in Acts 1.8, you will be my witnesses in Jerusalem, in Judea, in Samaria, and to all of the earth. And the gospel ministry is starting to go out. And so Paul is here in Ephesus, and he uh, finds 12 disciples. Now notice the way that they're discipled, the way that they 
receive the Holy Spirit is different than today. Paul at that time had the, the ability to do miraculous works. The Holy Spirit was operating in a bit different way at this time. He lays his hands on them and they receive the Spirit. And as a sign that the Spirit has come upon them, they begin these ecstatic utterances. They're speaking in tongues, which are just different human languages. They're prophesying, which men, means that they begin teaching, they begin preaching. All of that a sign that the Holy Spirit has come upon them. Very, very powerful uh, kind of thing. And so, as is typical with Paul, verse 8, it says he entered into the local synagogue and he continues teaching and speaking out boldly there for three months and he's reasoning and he's persuading with not only Jews, but also later on we'll see with Gentiles. In fact, Paul gets in a lot of trouble here in Acts 19. He does some miracles here. Uh, and uh, the people begin seeing this, and then um, he uh, begins to get involved with a, a bit of a, a problem with a man named Demetrius who has an idol-making business, and um, he ends up getting arrested. So a lot going on here, but this is the beginning kind of of the ministry. And so um, the founder, going back to the book of Colossians, of this church is not Paul. It's a convert of Paul. It's a convert of Paul uh, who, uh, Paul had never been there, but Epaphras, the convert that Paul administered to, was. And it's thought that Epaphras is the one that goes here to uh, uh, Colossae and does the good work of bringing the word here. So look at verse 5 here in Colossians 1, verse 5. Going back to 3, it says, We give thanks to God, the Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, praying always for you since we heard of your faith in Christ Jesus and the love which you have for all the saints because of the hope laid up for you in heaven, of which you previously heard in the word of truth, the gospel which has come to you, just as in all the world also it is constantly bearing fruit and increasing, even as it has been doing in you since the day you heard of it and understood the grace of God in truth, just as you learned it from... A really long sentence, right? It kind of goes on and on and ever. But you learned it from Epaphras. That's why Paul can say, we rejoice that we have heard this great work is taking place Amongst you. And so Epaphras is likely the founder. He was apparently saved during a visit to Ephesus, and then he goes and he does what those early Christians did so well. He plants a church by sharing the gospel in his own place when he returns home to Colossae. Now, Epaphras is really important in this church. Because while Epaphras is there, and we don't really know a lot about his role. I don't know if he was an elder. He might have been. But this is a very young church, so they might not have even been mature enough early on to have that. But he's a leader in the church. And he's there, and he starts, I'm going to use that analogy again of the matzo ball. He starts seeing how his Christian teaching he's been sharing with them is kind of being put together in this thick pudding, a matzo ball with teachings from the East, and there are heresies that are growing here. Now, the heresies that are growing here are concerning enough for Epaphras. He's so concerned about the false teaching that's growing that he actually takes a long journey to Rome where Paul is under house arrest to tell Paul about it. He's worried, and he's going to go back to his doctor father, the guy who's mentored him in the faith, and he's going to get some wisdom. What do I do? Turn over to Colossians 4, verses 12 through 13. Paul names him again there. He says, Epaphras, who is one of your number, a bond slave of Jesus Christ, sends you his greetings. So we know that Epaphras is not there right now. He's gone over to be where Paul is. Paul's in Rome. He sends you his greetings, always laboring earnestly for you in his prayers, that you may stand perfect and fully assured in all the will of God. For I testify for him that he has a deep concern for you and for those who are in Laodicea and 
Hierapolis. So he's gone over and made a pretty arduous journey. Remember, this is not as simple as jumping on a plane in those days. You've got to travel all of the roads that the Romans were so wonderful at building. And he goes over to Rome and he carries this concern there. So he's concerned about false teaching. Now, does anybody have any idea or has heard about some of the characteristics of the false teaching that had come to Colossae? We haven't talked about it yet, but there's a number of really good Bible students in here, so I want to give space for sharing. What do we know about the false teaching? What have you heard about the false teaching? can talk a little bit about it. I did already say one thing. The false teaching most directly affected orthodox teachings about Jesus. And so one of the areas that it most dangerously affected was the teaching about Jesus. The teaching about Jesus. One of the big things that began to be taught about Jesus in this false teaching in this church was that Jesus was a created being. He was not literally God. He was the greatest of God's creations, but that's quite a change from what we teach about faithfully about Jesus. This seems to be a really trademark or hallmark of what's being taught there. Turn over to Colossians chapter 1, and uh, Mike... Do you have Colossians 1 there? Okay. <clears throat> While Mike gets there, imagine for a moment that the teaching, the false teaching in this place has really affected this church in specific areas, particularly surrounding faithful teachings about Jesus. Knowing that, listen to what Paul's big concern is in the first part of Colossians 1. Would you read, Mike, uh, verses 15 through 20? The Son is the image of the invisible God, the firstborn over all creation. For in him all things were created, things in heaven and on earth, visible and invisible. Whether thrones or powers or rulers or authorities, all things were created through him and for him. He is before all things, and in him all things hold together. And he is the head of the body, the church. He is the beginning and the firstborn from among the dead, so that in everything he might have the supremacy. For God was pleased to have all his his fullness dwell in him, and through him to reconcile to himself all things, whether things on earth or things in heaven, by making peace through his blood shed on the cross. Thank you, Mike. We're going to end here for today, but there was a teaching in the church that was challenging faithful things people needed to know about Jesus. And so remember I said, one of the big themes of the book of Colossians is the preeminence of Christ, how he is preeminent or head over all things. The reason why in the first two chapters, Paul is going to press into that again and again and again is because of the way in which this kind of ugly matzo ball was forming itself in the hearts and minds of the people. Their background, just the air that they breathed, the intellectual ideas swirling around them were influencing their view of something as central as their view of Jesus. And so Paul is really going to help them reframe. And he's written this letter because beloved Epaphras or Epaphras has come out to Rome and said, I'm really worried about some of the things that are going on out there. And Paul's like, let me write a letter. And that letter came under the inspiration of the Spirit to the Scripture, and they received it. And what is Paul talking about? He's talking about Jesus. And so what's going to happen is, over the next course of weeks, Lord willing, we'll spend time looking at the first two chapters of Colossians, which is all about kind of doctrine. We learn about the preeminence of Christ. And what happens is Paul, he turns in the third chapter into us, very practically, and says, because these things are true, or therefore, all that he said, if you have been raised up with this Christ, keep seeking the things above. And he's going to talk about what that means. In fact, for you who were in class this morning, you might listen today, I'm preaching over 
being compassionate as a pledge to God. I am compassionate. Compassion is a hallmark of the Christian life. And the verse that I'll reference and go to is from this third chapter of Colossians. Colossians 3, which says, if you've been raised with Christ, think on things above, and he goes on like that. And then he says, like clothing, put on. And one of the things he talks about putting on is compassion. We are meant to put on compassion. Why? Because of this Jesus. Because that's who He is. So we'll come back to this next week in chapter 1 and we'll begin working our way through the letter itself proper. We've done some introduction today, which was good. And I would say the big takeaway today is where you're from and your background relationally, doctrinally, religiously, and spiritually, it really does affect your view of what you believe and why you believe it. All of us are a rich diversity of backgrounds and experiences, and we bring that to the fold. And I do think it makes us better and stronger. Sometimes left unchecked, if we don't check those assumptions and presuppositions, though, by the word, we can get a bit of a matzo ball, which is not as beautiful as it should be. But here in Colossae, Paul's written a beautiful letter to help him get a little bit straight on some of the most important stuff, like who is Jesus? And so we'll spend our time this fall thinking about that through the lens of this little letter. And hopefully there'll be a blessing along the way. Tim, would you close us in prayer this morning?